morning, everyone. Um, I'm Tom Stanley, state representative from Waltham, which is part of the Charles River Watershed Association. And today we're going to talk about a bunch of amendment that is specifically for Waltham, but it's really for the whole Charles River Watershed. It's a pilot program, and we have uh, folks from the Charles River Watershed Association that are going to uh, explain everything. Uh, we really need all the help we can get well, the Water Strand Association I was like what 35 cities and towns and a uh, million people, so the representatives and senators uh, are hoping that uh, we'll, we'll be support, supportive of this budget amendment if it is a budget amendment or within the budgets. And so, uh, we're going to talk specifically today about county pond involvement and about how to restore some wetlands. But also do some things that will allow water to be released before a storm comes and then to retain the water in the large pond while the storm is happening. So it will be reduced flooding downstream. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Jen Ryan. Yeah. Great, thank you everybody um, for coming today here in Omaha. And a big thank you to Representative Stanley for pulling this together and staff for making this happen. I want to recognize the legislators that are here in person and online, the representative Jones. Thank you for coming. And online, Senator Judy Whitaker, Senator Rauch, Senator Tyler, Representative Rogers, Representative Peich, and Senator Barrett. I have heard from today from their staff for joining us. We also have members of the Charles River Climate Compact. And Bob Wynn, the engineer from the state of Montana. And with us from CRWA, we have Emily Morton, our executive director. We have our communications director, Julia Hopkins, policy advocate, Hugh Smith, and our kind of that director, Julia Morton, will be here in the forefront shortly. And as our families met, I am Jim Ryan, the executive director of advocacy at CRWA. And we're here today to talk about climate change, which is water change, be it drought, or as we'll discuss today, increased flooding. Flooding is projected to significantly increase in the watershed and throughout Massachusetts in ways that can be very hard for us to imagine. As my son said recently, talking about this team, and I can volunteer with the Waltham Trust, who is here, we're going to be seeing flood days all year round instead of snow days. It's going to be very, very difficult. Okay. The next slide is the Oops. Thank you. Okay. Our mission is to protect, restore, and enhance the Charles River and watershed through science, advocacy, and law. We were founded in 1965 by concerned citizens who felt that the Charles could do better, could be cleaner, and we could be better for our river. It's one of the oldest watershed associations in the country. And we work with the EPA, our 35 watershed municipalities, and partners across the watershed. We have interdisciplinary staff. We do river science, stormwater management, climate change, law, advocacy, and policy. And one of our major programs is the climate compact, which Julie will introduce and talk about today. Julie. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, this is exciting. Thank you so much, Rep. Stanley, for hosting and having us. Um, excited to be. New World Hybrid um, Moret as well. So hi to all my folks. Um, in room folks, I feel like these chairs look so comfortable. <laughs> I'm all standing. So um, I would invite you to move this one chair. <laughs> I forget to, but it's good for me. I'm... So uh, I am going to speak about our uh, facts, give you some background about the project um, we've been working on together, why we're doing it, um, and then talk about the three project that we have. Um, so here's an image of the Charles River watershed. At CRWA, we take a watershed scale view. The watershed is essentially a river stream basin. 
Um, the Charles is 80 miles long. Some people think it's only this 10 miles in Boston and Cambridge. Nope, it starts all the way up in Hopkinton. Um, same with the marathon. Takes a very winding route, not, not a 26 mile straight shot. 80 miles winding, because that's what rivers do in England. Um, as Rep. Sanary mentioned, 35 cities and towns in the watershed, about a million residents, it's a very densely developed area, um, and 308 square mile um, square miles across the entire land area. Um, I would like to acknowledge that the Charles River watershed is on the occupied territories of Massachusetts and um, and Wampanoag people. Um, as we talk about land stewardship, it's so important to um, acknowledge that our time frame of land stewardship is much is, is quite short on a historical scale. Um, and so we are working with Native partners, um, trying to understand more about traditional knowledge. Um, and it, it's actually interesting and exciting some of the um, some of the traditional techniques that may have application as we talk about adapting to a changing climate. Climate change. It's here. It's here. Um, seems like every week new new news about it. New new generally bad news about it. This week being no exception of course with the new report coming out um, just about urgency, urgency, um, the impacts. So I don't spit too much, um, but we know that in our area, flooding, heat, drought, and likely problems we are not foreseeing at the moment are coming up. Uh, so today I'll mostly be focusing on flooding and specifically in our watershed. So just bringing it from the global to the local. These are all photos taken across our watershed of flooding. So I just want to talk a little bit. What do I what do I mean about flooding? I mean, I think basically people understand, but flooding, when you're thinking about managing it, it's essentially too much water in the same place at the same time. So when you think about solutions, you can think about, okay, well, can we spread it out? Can it not be all in the same place? Can we slow it down? Can it not happen all at the same time? So too much water in the same place at the same time. And then is it a problem? Maybe. Maybe it's not a problem in the picture on the lower left. If that's just the natural, if you know, excuse me, on the bottom here, if that's just a natural area, flooding is a natural phenomenon. So the problem is when flooding intersects with our those environment. That's really what we're talking about. Okay. Not going to go too far into the technicalities here. Um, I'm guessing maybe a lot of folks have been to briefings about what's coming for our client and have seen this kind of thing before. Um, this is basically showing that rainstorms are going to get bigger and big rainstorms are going to come more often. One key note I want to make here, though, these are showing the size of what we call a design storm. So a two-year storm, 10-year storm, I'll talk about the 10-year, it's got a 1% chance of happening in any given year. And it's you know, however many inches, five plus inches. We call these design storms because we use them to design our built environment. We use them to make development decisions, where to build them. We are building for the world on the far left here. The things we're building will still be here when the rainfall scenario on the far right happens. Most of them, much of them. So we're making current day decisions with incomplete information, incorrect information, essentially. And, uh, you know, this, this, this could also be a surrogate for a lot of other decision tools for using, like, um, like, like our, flood, our flood zones, our current day human flood zones. Okay, so that was a quick capsule of the problem, probably something many things your folks are familiar with, I think. Um, and now we're going to get into the solutions. Hopefully the 
more um, exciting part. So Jen mentioned the Charles River Climate Compact. This is a consortium through voluntary partnership of cities and towns in the watershed that Charles River Watershed Association founded and now manages that is working on a regional scale to address both climate adaptation challenges and mitigation challenges. Um, so you can see our um, mission statement is up there. We were, founded, we were founded in 2019, so it was a relatively new group. And this month, we actually just finished a strategic plan as a group to guide our work for the next few years. One of the main project initiatives that the Charles River Climate Compact has undertaken to date is our Charles River Flood Model Project. This is funded by the Massachusetts Home Really Preparedness Grant Program. We really appreciate their funding. We could not have done any of this without that funding. Um, and so just a quick summary of the project. We developed a computer model of the watershed that lets us simulate these different rainfall scenarios, both current day and future. So let's us simulate this rainfall, which then shows us where and when the flooding is going to be. So it's helping to allow us, give us the data we need to make decisions today about what's going to be there in the future. Um, and so the project is right now in its third year. We developed the model. Having the model, we can also use it to test test out different flood reduction strategies. That way you can know the impact of the strategy before we make the investment. We all know this is going to be expensive. Adapting to climate change in a region like ours is not going to be cheap. But if we can understand the benefits as best as possible before making that investment, we're going to be better off. Um, it also, just back to my first slide, it also takes a watershed scale view. Uh, which you really can't understand flooding at any other scale. The watershed boundaries define are defined by how the water is moving. So by using this watershed scale to do the model, we have much more complete information than if each community was trying to do this on their own and just guessing what was coming, what was going on upstream of them, and sort of maybe not caring so much about what was going on downstream of them. Um, so we have developed some flood mitigation projects, one of which I'm going to talk about today. Um, a lot of community engagement, um, hearing, hearing from people in the community about their concerns, what they'd like to see when it comes to flood reduction. Uh, and we developed a um, flood adaptation and mitigation plan, um, which we are actually going to update again shortly. Um, just a little bit more details on the model. All the results are available online, so you can, it's just linked from our website. You can go in, you can check it out, zoom around in your neighborhood. Um, the, initial develop, the initial model developed in 2021, updated it last year. We have climate projections for 2030 and 2070, and then we also have current day scenarios, as well as past real-world storm scenarios that helps you and make sure you're on the right track with your model because it shows you that is, the, is what you're seeing on the computer what happened in real life. Um, and it'll show the location and approximate depth of flooding. So check it out when we have a minute. Um, the other reason we wanted to do it at the watershed scale, not just to, for technical reasons, but just for practical reasons, if each town was trying to do this on their own and they weren't really using the same data, maybe they weren't using the same scenarios, um, and it's going to be a real patchwork potentially of what people are using for planning for the future. So for the region to be all on the same page, it's going to provide much more consistency, which is always good. Let's be um, Developing a statewide river hydraulic model is an action from the 2018 um, state SHIMCAP, the state's climate plan. Um, it's not an action the state has able, been able to make progress on statewide, um, but obviously with state funding, we were able to provide it for the trucks. All right, so obviously we've you know, been at this for three years. We've learned a lot. I won't go exhaustively into each scenario we've run, um, but I just wanted to highlight a few of them. 
So as I mentioned, we do just straight storm scenarios to see where and when the flooding is going to happen. Um, and then we also run these flood reduction scenarios to see what might help. Um, so one of these was to look at adding a lot more green stormwater infrastructure. These are things like rain gardens, infiltration trenches, um, bioretention cells. They're designed to essentially capture the water in a garden and slow it down when the water feeds the plants, um, maybe it goes into the ground and doesn't even get into it. So what if we added a lot more of it? We added enough to store runoff from a four and a half inch rainstorm. So that, that's a big, that's a big rainstorm. Um, and it was going to capture four and a half inches of runoff from half of all the impervious members, half of all the parking lots, buildings, sidewalks, roadways. Um, so that's that's a lot of green infrastructure. Um, so I'll direct your eyes there to the bar chart. I'm sorry, I made the page charts. Um, I don't have a ton of them, there's just two, but <laughs> um, the green line is flooding from a current day storm. The dark blue line in the middle is flooding without the green infrastructure. And then the light blue line is if you add in that green infrastructure I was talking about. So even adding all that green infrastructure, it doesn't get us down to current day flooding levels. So here we are, I think you're all ambitious. You're adding all this green infrastructure. Not gonna be enough. So that's a little bit of a theme, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll get more helpful. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Then we also wanted, you know, that was kind of pressing. We were like, oh, not depressing enough. Let's let's look at if we can actually make it worse. And the answer is yes, we can make it worse. So another scenario we ran is what is some of this green and open space, forest, just grasslands that is throughout the watershed? What if we um, developed it? So this is land that's not currently protected in any conservation um, easement or any legal way. So if we per, if we develop just 15% of this land, um, again, it's the same setup. Green is current day, middle dark blue is no action, and then the light blue shows us, wow, if we develop that land, it's actually getting the flooding is actually getting get a lot worse. So the quick takeaway that we can learn from that is there's actually a lot of land out there that's providing this de facto flood control that we're not thinking about. We're not thinking about the fact that that land is actually protecting people downstream. Kind of just sit there. We're probably not thinking about it at all. Okay. Um, so summary, what we learned, we have a great um, a WVR report in Colin Randy. Awesome summary article on this last November. Um, probably could have just read it. I could have just been quiet this whole time. Um, but <laughs> just the highlights of what we learned. Future flood risks are significant for our region. Um, that that is going to be a problem. The downstream and in our case, the more developed communities will be the most impacted. Obviously, that's where all the water is going. That's where most of the development and most of the population is. Um, and as I suggested, we're going to need, there's no one solution that we've found so far. It's, it's more likely that we're going to need a lot of different solutions. Um, regional collaboration is key, uh, and we need to get started because we have some time. If we're talking 2070, but, but we need to get started. These, these projects can take uh, projects that you know, projects that are results of the March 2010 flooding that we had. Some folks remember that because it was pretty memorable around here. Some projects that were designed in response to that are just getting built now, 13 years later. It takes a while, so we need to get started. Okay, so zooming in, one project we would like to get started on is the Hardy Pond Flood Project. 
Carney Pond is a 45 acre pond located in the northern part of Waltham, sort of nestled right between the 95 to intersection. Um, it's surrounded by some private residential area, a public park, some roadways. It outlets to Chesterbrook, which is a tributary to the Charles River. Um, the project partners are ourselves, the City of Waltham, and the Harvey Pond Association. This is located in an environmental justice block road with the minority definition for the MAPS 2020 environmental justice definition. <laughs> um, and so I mentioned we need to take a regional and watershed view. The Hardy Pond project is a perfect example of that. Um, the watershed approach essentially means you, you're going to have more tools in your toolbox. So up at the top, I'm just going to use the cursor here. Okay. Up at the up at the top here. Um, this is Hardy Pond. It outlets here into Chester Brook, flows down, and eventually meets up with the main stem of the Charles, goes underground here for a bit. Once you get down here, this is that downstream flooding I was talking about. In this case, it's also the more densely developed part of the watershed. Um, if you're only looking at solutions down here, you have very few tools. Really, the only thing you can try and do is move that water through faster so that it's not getting backed up and it's not, it's not causing flooding. If you look at the whole watershed, though, you have a whole bunch more tools at your disposal. Up here in Tommy Pond, what we're looking at doing is storing more water. Ponds are things that hold water. We're just going to take more advantage of that. We're just going to hold more water than we can store. If you look at the Chester Brook up here, maybe there's some spots where you can add more floodplain. Maybe there's some spots where you can add more storage. Um, and so you're really expanding your toolbox if you take the whole watershed approach. Zooming more in on what we're talking about, which is the Hardy Pond area. This project has three components. One is altering the pond outlet so that you can hold more water when you need to. Um, you can look at the rainfall forecast when that four and a half inch rainstorm is coming. You can lower the lake level to some reasonable amount. Maybe it's maybe it's the same level it had all winter, but you're just controlling it now. Lowering the level, then raising the outlet so that as the rain falls. It just stores up, just stores it there in the pond, and like your bathtub. You put down the drain, and the water doesn't go anywhere. Um, the second piece is removing fill to restore the adjacent wetlands. That's also going to provide more storage opportunity, allow water to move in and out of the wetlands more easily. And this is fill that essentially shouldn't be there. It was basically put in before that was illegal, and then um, and now we just want to take it out. And then adding some of these green infrastructure stormwater solutions around the pond. Um, these are all, I should mention, these are all ideas that actually came from previous studies. The study that identified the outlet control is from the 1980s. So none of this is really, none of this is really new. None of this is super innovative stuff that Sierra Nevada came up with. None of this is from the community. Uh, most of them is really all from the community. Um, we just want to put it all together. And what we've been able to do is because we have the flood model, we're able to kind of understand how to maximize these projects and, and what you can do to really maximize the flood benefit. So that's what this shows you here, the flood reduction. Um, basically, all the little ones, um, octopus, you see in red are flooding that we should prevent. And again, this is just sort of one, one potential scenario, um, you know, one potential rainstorm, one potential outlet operation scenario. So, um, but what it tells us is there's potential here to reduce flooding, um, both around the pond and then potentially downstream, especially the immediate downstream area. Also three acres of restored wetland area, um, protecting climate on the rural residents, adding new habitat. 
Um, so our request that um, we are so happy to have um, partnership from Stanley's office is to advance this project, really um, get more into the design, get get more get more details. Um, so 200,000 for the city of Waltham to accelerate this study, ultimately set us up for implementation, finding the design, understanding permitting, um, and of course, public engagement. So as I said, a lot of these ideas came from the community, but some of them are old and um, we're supposed to move in and out of town, so we want to make sure everybody is Uh, just quickly mention, we do have some additional projects that we're looking at all across the watershed because I know I'm sounding like a broken record here, but one project is not enough. There's no silver bullet. We have to do this everywhere and we have to start doing it. So we're looking all across the watershed, back to that watershed approach slide, slide matching the solution to the location. Um, so we have the tentative project in the Longfellow Plan System in Wellesley, um, looking at an area around Weston Town Center, the Brothers Market there that floods a lot. Um, but there's also you know, some nice wetland areas around there that, that show some promise to, again, yeah, hold water in the areas where it's not going to cause damage. The Albemarle Field in Newton, adding some storage on the Sunday Fields, um, which is the same idea of the Open Park project in Medway, which is what the image is of. Um, and then Natick High School is looking at some opportunities on Natick High School, which is a pretty urbanized campus, a lot of parking lot buildings. So we're going to find some unique solutions there. We're going to be working with the students. Um, what's coming? Um, we have actually an online meeting on the Natick High School project on April 11th um, in the evening. Love to have more Natick residents, interested parties join us for that. We also will be getting out in the community. So since it's our third year of the project, a lot of it has been impacted by the pandemic, but um, we are going full force this spring. Get out in the community, talk to folks. It's a list of some upcoming appearances that we will be making on the project with our um, wonderful outreach partners, communities responding to the spring weather or the crew. They've been a super valuable partner on this project. Um, Help a lot with the average and do a lot of it themselves. Um, and then in June, we'll have a full on wrap up of kind of this year's work. That will be online as well. Please join. Um, and then summer 2023, we'll just keep up with the in person community engagement. Um, so I'm going to take a pause now for questions on my piece. Is that too much? The question. Um, maybe um, I wonder if while people are thinking for questions, um, could we unmute Bob Wynn from um, the city of Waltham to see if he wants to add anything? He can't oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Good. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for your consideration of this. Um, and, and thanks Julie and, and the Charles River Watershed Association for partnering on this. Yeah, th this is an important project for, for Waltham, um, not only for the flooding, but also um, Hardy Farms is a really great resource for the city. Um, and this project is also going to have a, a, a dual benefit of helping, you know, with water quality too, which is also an issue issue with the pond. So. Um, but as Julie mentioned, we we really do have some serious problems in Waltham with flooding, uh, especially in the Chesterbrook area downstream. And the city is investing, and we and we have other projects that you know that we're working on. Um, as Julie indicated, you know it's going to take a number of different projects, unfortunately, to to address the flooding. So, um, so we could really use some help on this one as the city is investing on some of the other projects uh, that we're doing. So, uh, appreciate your uh, consideration. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, so how how many 
projects like this or maybe different but accomplish the same general goal you know can you see throughout the watershed um I'll probably repeat the question make sure oh yeah um, the question was how many projects, this is kind of site specific projects, do we see across the watershed? Um, so I would say I don't, we don't know exactly how many. Um, well, I guess what I should say is it's going to take a lot of them. How big is a lot um, will depend on how effective each individual project is. At the moment, we have a list of about 40 plus projects, potential projects that we've identified. Um, we're moving forward with, uh, you know, half a dozen to at least get concept designs, um, get a better understanding of what works on different types of sites, you know, so that we can kind of use those lessons and carry them throughout the watershed. Um, but generally what we see as far as if you want to really, it, let's say your goal was to get future flooding down to current day levels. If, if, we, if we felt like that was acceptable, maybe we don't feel like that. Maybe we want to, you know, get even better, bounce forward as, as they say. Um, it's going to take on the ground projects like this, um, you know, dozens. Dozens, probably, you know, to over 100. Um, and policy changes and just changes in sort of the regular urban business, the way we, um, the way we build things, the way we design things. Um, so that's the, that's the multi-pronged approach. So we're looking at both individual projects, things you implement, and more policy and practice changes. And layering all those on top of each other to ultimately help us get to to whatever we decide our, our goal is for making this flooding, which we haven't really fully defined that that question yet. So perhaps if we if the had a farm project continues and is implemented and shows success, and some others, and maybe perhaps down the road we could have. A, you know, state funds that might help the whole watershed and also potentially the Mystic, Mystic uh, River watershed as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, just in case I was here, um, Grass Stanley was saying that this can serve an example project and potentially um, funding for similar projects like this. Um, so I know that I mentioned the project has three components, the outlet structure modification, the wetland and the green infrastructure. Um, most of the flood benefits are coming from the first piece, the pond outlet modification. So that is a flood management technique that does show a good amount of promise. Um, and a lot of that is because of that timing issue. If you can just keep water in one place where it's not causing problems for a little longer or time into the storm a little better, um, and we have so much data and real-time controls at our fingertips now. Um, so this that is that piece of the solution is one that shows a lot of first day wide implementation well for implementation across our watershed for sure and I'm sure statement. So you uh, add like a list of like 40 potential ones coming. Yes. What what criteria do you use that we're looking at for the community what should be something that has a potential publicly owned on privately owned on what what are you using for yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, so should repeat the question again. Uh, uh, okay. Those are the mics, right? Yeah, I think it should be off. Okay, okay. Uh, good. Okay. So the um, so what are we looking for? The way we did it for this project is we put out a call um, to the municipal participants, so the municipal staff members, 
And then we also put out a general call to the community since, you know, some of these ideas, like I said, come from past studies that we might have never asked. Um, and what we said was for our project, we were looking for um, space. Water does take up space. It's a little bit of that energy story, right? Like, you need to hold the water somewhere, you know, and it's large. Um, so, Larger areas where you can either underground cold water or allow for more flooding during wet weather um, is is good. And then we were looking for projects that have potential for more near term implementation. So ideas that were already on the table, things that were on public property, not private property. Um, if anything, already had you know some level of design, and then we were also looking for near-term benefits. Um, so if it's near and no flooding issue that you can you know solve for an immediate issue and also build for future adaptation, um, that that's also what we were looking for. Again, just because as I keep saying, we really kind of wanted to get started, so we wanted these to be things that we. Could um, but as we know, it's going to take so much. I mean, we can start thinking opportunistically about anything that comes up. What, you know, how can we, what's the right solution for this site thinking, you know, not just with our 2023 brains, but with our 27 brains as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, just like what kind of projects did we get? We did get a lot of um, private, I'm sorry, public parks. Um, we got some in-stream, like, restoration ideas, you know, taking out little tiny culverts that um, bound the stream and now the wildlife, you know, helping that we help them with conveyance, maybe helping with some more flood planes. Um, we got um, some wetland areas, um, mostly public. Mostly public, yeah, public parcels. I'll just say a brief reflection. One project we're working on is looking at a land conservation package. I think it's at 18 thousand acres that are undeveloped and unprotected in the watershed. And we're trying to understand sort of what the universe is and what could be protected as a larger scale because they're creating infrastructure projects. And that would work across the space. I just jump in with one. Um, Julie touched on the importance of the projects, but as well as policy changes. So, just some examples. <clears throat> and I'll take the online people can see you. Oh, great. Is that part of it? Okay. Oh, yeah. Where you are. Um, so, let me just this heavy stuff. Um, yes. Um, so um, the projects are vital, but there's a lot of tools that you all have as state leaders. So, um, for example, our communities are spending tens of millions of dollars on police and fire to keep our communities safe from threats that we recognize. So there's really, if you, if you ask your city leaders to think about it, it's really someone whose job it is to protect people from flooding and looking at land use decisions. Um, for example, the recent guidance around the MBTA's Communities Act, which is trying to generate more housing, says that a community may consider restricting development in the flood zone. It doesn't say shall, it, it has it as, as an option. It doesn't really uh, reflect the urgency of the situation. Um, we've been working with Senator Green on a bill that would replicate the Green Communities Act, which incentivizes communities to invest in mitigation, energy efficiency, uh, fuel efficient vehicles, et cetera, on something on the resilience side. So every community, thanks to state legislation, has to have a tree board. That's awesome. No one is required to have a flooding protection person. So these are some things that can help us get ahead of that. Like literally today, Comcom's local officials are making decisions around development based on FEMA flood maps, which do not take updated precipitation into account and are not about to be updated anytime soon. 
So there really is a really, really important role for state legislators to be helping cities and towns get ahead of this um, as, as this, uh, this new, new world is, is already here and it's just going to get worse. So yeah. 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 I just want to preview a couple of upcoming events for everyone. We're going to be on the legislative briefing on April 4th at 9 a.m. at Chase and I. These are our legislative priorities, um, as Emily mentioned, that we us, particularly ties into the conversation today. And I just want to note that we have an advocacy center online, a couple of those fact sheets that you see, and a newsletter, and national records you can find at court. So hopefully you'll join us for that. Look for a sign up for that shortly. We're also going to be hosting field trips with legislators and staff this summer. If you're interested, please let us know. We'll be reaching uh, out to people to talk about drought, um, jam removal, et cetera. We're having a faculty environmental advocate in Massachusetts Patagonia this summer. And a film series, I'm in action on and off the screen, co-hosted by Turnaround Films, Charles River Master Bruce and Mass Audubon at Sugar Park. Should be a lot of fun. Next week is our annual meeting for honorary representative Ruth Alder representing the Lands Preservation Act. And thank you everyone for support for the passage of that important one. You can register online. And I'm just going to say thank you again to Representative Stanley for hosting this event and for everyone for coming. These are our names and our email if you want to reach out to us again. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your attention.